Uh, before I start talking about configuration management, uh, I'm going to give you some, uh, some disclosures and caveats. I'm going to be talking in some detail this evening about, uh, about four different products. And I think most of you have heard of most of them, if not all of them. There's, uh, there's Salt, of course, there's Puppet, there's Chef, and there's Ansible. Anyone not heard of those? We've all heard of uh, most of them. Okay. Now, first off, I am going to be biased. I'm going to try and be objective, but you should expect me to have biases, okay? Because I work for SaltStack. Um, I'm going to try and approach this from my point of view, uh, working in the field. I did uh, web programming for years and years and years. And then I did ops for a few years. I did some training. I did some QA, and uh, I even went to uh, to puppet training uh, about three or four years ago, and. Uh, I'm going to tell you about how I approach this and how I see these things. And uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that my views reflect the marketing department at SALT. So I want to get that out of the way. I have only used Puppet and SALT professionally. Uh, I've used them both extensively, though SALT much more recently than Puppet. Um, I have a buddy at Rackspace that uh, helped me out with the examples for, uh, for Chef and Ansible. If I screwed something up, then, uh, then you guys, I'm sure, will let me know. We have some a lot of DevOps pro professionals here tonight, right? And I do want to point out that I have met people from every single one of these companies. In fact, I met Michael Dehan at Puppet Training uh, for the, it was his, I think his second week working for Puppet Labs and uh, his second of three weeks. <laughs> he wasn't there for very long and, uh, and then he took off and went and worked at a couple other places and then went off and, uh, and founded Ansible. Uh, Michael is a great guy. He's very talented. Uh, I've, co of course, met some of the public guys. The, uh, my trainer was uh, Jeff McCune, who still works for Puppet. He's one of the core devs now. And a uh, great guy, absolutely brilliant. And uh, I met, uh, I can't even think of the guy's name that uh, works as Chef. He's actually a Python guy working at this uh, Ruby shop. And absolutely brilliant guy. Um, if you guys think I'm going to go and, and talk smack about these companies, no. We have some really great products out there, some really brilliant people behind these products. And if you happen to be using one of these products that isn't salt, then I'm, I'm, not, gonna, I'm not gonna diss you on it, okay? There's some really great stuff out there. Let's go through a quick timeline here. And I'm gonna talk about these projects in, uh, in a small amount of detail based on when they first started up. And uh, I'm focusing on the big four, and I'm going to call CF Engine one of the big five, and I, I think that you know where, which of the one of those five it is. Uh, CF Engine has been around for a long, long time. Now, it wasn't the first configuration management tool of this type, but it was the first really big one. It was the first one to kind of start revolutionizing the world of, of configuration management and, uh, and start getting people to stop making Snowflake servers and start uh, defining a configuration that not only applied to all the servers, but was automatically applied to all the servers. CF Engine is this tool that would uh, sit on the machine and watch for files to be changed, and if they weren't in line with, uh, with what they were supposed to be, then it would change them back. Now, first off, I want to point out, when you have files changing on, on servers, why is that happening? People. people. People are changing them. Are these people that should be changing them? Now, the first company I worked at that had CF Engine, uh, we had, uh, we had a three or four dozen uh, production servers. And I was in the QA department of that company. And the guy that was uh, senior to me in that department, what he would do if he wanted to test something and he wanted to make sure that it was, he was in an environment that was exactly like production, he would go grab a production server. He would take it out of the load balancer. He would apply code to it. He'd turn off CF Engine. He would apply code to it, and he'd test it. And if he was happy with it, then he would you know, turn CF Engine back on, set it back to uh, what it was, and put it back in the load balancer. And you know, about 95% of the time, that didn't cause any problems. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you guys can kind of see this problem here. We have a lot of people at a lot of companies that are getting on production servers that should not be on production servers. If you're going to be tes testing stuff in a production-like environment, you should be creating a production-like environment and not just using production, right? So if you're managing configuration drift, which is what the puppet guys call it, uh, that's because somebody has done something wrong, OK? It could not just be the person that actually did it, but also the person that allowed them to do it, or all the people that allowed them to do it. Uh, CF Engine was not necessarily created that for that. 
It was created because the, uh, the university that Mark was going to at the time, um, they gave him a whole bunch of machines and he had to keep com configuration the same on all these machines and he wrote a tool to do it. It's been through three different iterations now. It's on CF Engine 3, uh, three different uh, really refactorings. Uh, it, is, uh, it is still a big tool in the marketing, marketing place. It is not nearly as big as the other tools we're going to discuss at this point, but it is still big. A lot of people really like it. Uh, what a lot of people really don't like is the usage. Uh, this was designed back in, uh, in 93 originally, and this was not a time when we had a whole lot of Python being used. Python was around, but it was really young. Heck, Perl was really young at that time. Uh, people, if they're doing system administration, they knew C. And they're happy to deal with configuration that, was, that made sense to people that use C. And so CF Engine worked really well for them. Nowadays, a lot of people seem, uh, see it to be a little bit arcane. Okay? So one of these guys was Luke Knies. Uh, he was a core dev for CF Engine for a while. He was really unhappy with it. He was working on uh, CF Engine 2. Uh, there were a lot of things he didn't like about it. In fact, he did a talk uh, at least 10 years ago called, What's Wrong with CF Engine? And shortly after he did this talk, he, uh, he went off and started working on, uh, on Puppet. And uh, at some point, he went and got some funding and built a company around it. But by that point, people were really liking Puppet. It's, uh, it's much easier to use. Uh, it's built around the, the concept of having easy to put together configuration. Um, he, uh, when he was working on this, he actually went through a few different languages. He looked at Perl first, and Perl wasn't doing what he wanted. He looked at Python. He didn't like what Python was doing. He looked at Ruby, and he settled on Ruby, and he really liked that. Uh, so he started working on Puppet as his configuration really for CF Engine. It, he considered it to be kind of the, uh, the next generation of configuration management. And, uh, and who here has used Puppet? Who used it when I was really, really young? A couple of you guys have, and it's, it changed your world, didn't it? Things were great. Um, Puppet's a, a really great tool, and I thoroughly enjoyed using it for the first couple of years that I used it. Um, one of the things that it uses, and again, I haven't used CF Engine myself, I just know that we had it in use of that, that company, but uh, Puppet has what's called a DSL, a domain-specific language. It's not Ruby, but it's kind of Ruby-like. If you're somebody that's been using Ruby, then uh, it's something that uh, will look kind of familiar to you. And if you've been using uh, Perl or Python, then Ruby looks pretty familiar to you anyway. And if, in fact, if any of you guys have been using Perl, then the, uh, the weird operators will look really familiar to you, right? So another guy came along, uh, Adam Jacobs, and he liked kind of the direction it was going in, but he didn't like uh, that Puppet was non-deterministic. It's declarative. The idea is that by default, when you define something in Puppet, you say, okay, I need this to happen, I need this to happen, I need this to happen, go for it, Puppet, and Puppet will just go out and, and do what you tell it to do. And it's going to do it in whatever order makes sense to Puppet, right? Uh, Chef is more uh, imperative. You say, do this, then do this, then do this, then do this. And this, this makes sense to people that have been working in the dev world for a while, because when we write code, it's generally do this, then do this, do this. That's how scripts work, right? That's where we got the name script from anyway. It's like in Shakespeare. The actor does this, and then the actor does this, and then the actor does this. He doesn't just do things in whatever order, or else Macbeth would be a whole lot weirder than it already is, right? <laughs> so, uh, and Chef, I think, was one of the first companies to really start pushing this uh, infrastructure as code thing. They really started to push the, uh, the idea of DevOps. Now, DevOps is a fine thing, and I've always thought that, in fact, I've been saying for years that the best sysadmins have some programming background with them. And the best programmers have some ops background, right? I've been saying this for a long time, and I think that, that DevOps is a great, direct, a great move in that direction. Unfortunately, I have also worked for companies that have said, okay, we're going to have you be uh, one of the programmers, and we're also going to have you manage the servers because we're too cheap to hire ops. Has anyone worked with a company like that? And you may have discovered that when you start working for a company that starts doing that, they start cutting a lot of corners, not just, you know, let's have the, the programmers also do ops. Or uh, one particular company, I was the tech guy. I did all the programming, I did all the ops, and if something went wrong, then I called Rackspace, because they were hosting us. <laughs> okay. But, uh, so that's kind of the, the, where Chef is coming from. Now, 
along comes salt. Now, uh, Tom and I were working for uh, a music provider at the time, and uh, we were using a, a number of different mules, uh, tools. We had, uh, we had Puppet going. Uh, Tom has also been to Puppet training. Uh, Tom has submitted some code upstream to Puppet, unlike me. Uh, he, he did a lot of work there, and it was something that we really, really liked when we first got into it. Uh, he spent a few months trying to convince me to hire on at this company, and, uh, and a few months later, I, I finally did. And the day that I started, he said, OK, we've been using these tools. Uh, in particular, one was called Funk. And we're really unhappy with it. It keeps falling down. We can't get it to, to do what we need it to do. It's too difficult to use. Uh, so I'm going to write a new tool, and I'm going to call it Salt. I said, well, that sounds great. And two or three weeks later, he came in. He'd been working at it at home. And he said, hey, uh, it's, it's working, more or less. So uh, would you mind writing some modules for me? And so I started con contributing code. And that's how I got to be uh, the second person writing code for Salt. And, uh, and he started, he, you know, he put it up there. It was just a personal side project. He put it up, people started contributing to it. Uh, in fact, if any of you guys hang around in the, uh, in the SALT community, uh, the fourth person to contribute was Seth House, who is now an employee. And the fifth person was Pedro Algarvio, who uh, is a community member right now, but he's about to be uh, an employee as well. These people have been around for, for a long, long time. Um, and we discovered that uh, in I believe it was August of 2011, uh, LinkedIn started using Salt. Now, Salt was really young back then. I believe they started with version 0.8.3, which was barely stable. And uh, LinkedIn looked at it and said, hey, you know what? Uh, this is an open source project. We like the direction they're going in. We know that there's going to be bugs because they're so early on. Uh, so we'll just we'll roll with it, and uh, we'll see how things go. And we started using it in production at our company in October. So even LinkedIn has been using it longer than in production than we have. <laughs> and, uh, and we didn't even find out in, about LinkedIn until the next April. Uh, and then December of that year, that company gave us the opportunity to look at other opportunities. And uh, I went with one for a few months until Tom finally hired me on. Um, but uh, Tom took a different approach to this. In fact, originally Salt was only designed for remote execution. Uh, we wanted to, uh, our, our biggest need was to kick off monitoring jobs. We had a, a guy in charge of, of ops that was, he wanted to collect uh, vitals about the systems every five seconds because he was insane. Uh, no, a great guy actually, uh, but five seconds still seems like a lot to me. Uh, and he wanted to be able to analyze that in more or less real, real time and, uh, and be able to handle server load uh, based on those stats. And so Salt was designed to kick off monitoring every five seconds. Uh, it didn't even do remote execution for a long time. In fact, uh, remote execution, uh, LinkedIn did, wasn't even using it for their first year or so that they used it. It was still really young at the time. But uh, we realized that when you look at it, a lot of the things that we do in ops or even in development, is, uh, it's remote execution anyway. Uh, configuration management is a type of remote execution. You are going out to a, uh, well, with Puppet and, uh, and Chef and CF Engine, you had the remote system keeping track of these things, but you still have the remote system executing something remotely uh, based on something on, uh, stored on a master, right? Uh, monitoring, whether you're kicking off the job with Salt or whether you're doing an SNMP connection or whether you're doing uh, Nodjos or, or however it is you're doing it, monitoring is still a type of remote execution. Uh, again, this was a music platform, so we would kick off MP3 encodings remotely. We did a lot of remote execution, and we realized that uh, configuration management was just another type of remote execution. And at that point, it was trivial to just add it in. We could already do a package.install, so why not make it stateful? And rather than using a, a DSL like, uh, like Puppet and Chef were, were doing, we realized that when we define a system, uh, we're just talking about data. We're saying, OK, we need this, these packages installed. We need uh, these files to be managed by whatever service. We need these services to be running. And it's just a bullet point list, right? And so we, just, we started defining these things as data. And uh, in fact, we went with YAML because it's, uh, it's text-based. It's easy to modify. It's really easy to learn. And people don't have to learn a, a new programming language just to use their configuration manager. In fact, one of Tom's big beliefs is that your configuration manager should have as little configuration of its own as possible, at least required configuration, right? Why should you be putting so much effort into configuring your config manager, right? So even now, when you install Salt, you can install the master and have it running with zero configuration. 
when you install the minion, uh, you can have it running with technically with zero configuration, but there are a couple things that I think you should do. You should tell it where the master is instead of just telling it to look for a machine called salt. And I think you should explicitly say the name of the minion, but if you don't, it'll figure those things out. Okay. Uh, we also had a few uh, things that we came across when we were designing salt. Uh, we were worried about, uh, about scalability. Uh, again, we were running Puppet, and uh, has anyone run Puppet with WebBrick? How many, how many clients can we have at a time? One, maybe two if you're lucky, right? And then we move up to Apache, how many can we have? Under 40 max. Under 40 max? 140 max. 140 max, okay. Uh, we actually had, when we hit about 40 or 50 servers, we had to put up a second pu Puppet Master. And again, these we were doing everything out of VMs. Our boot server was a VM, it's very scary. We didn't do that. Um, but uh, yeah, we had scaling issues, and we, we assumed that we would also have, scale, have scaling issues with salt. And so a lot of things were put into salt in order to compensate for these scaling issues that we expected to have. Uh, things like the Syntax system. Uh, we were also running the, uh, the master behind HAProxy. And uh, we just assumed we'd have a lot of these problems. And once we got into it, we realized that salt, uh, because of how it how it runs the, uh, the remote execution bus, it can actually handle hundreds if not thousands of servers at the same time. If any of you guys play around with the, uh, uh, the minion swarm script in the test directory up on the repo, uh, you can actually spin up however many servers you want and see how long it takes before, uh, before the, the master falls over. Okay. Uh, next up, Ansible, Mr. Dehan. Uh, he created this the next year and uh, now, people that are really comfortable with SSH, which is most people that work in Linux, right? Uh, that was what he's targeting, was people that really just, he, uh, he understood that SSH was another type of remote execution, and he decided to go down that path. Now, the nice thing about SSH is it requires no agents on the remote machine, except for SSH. And in most cases, SSH is gonna be there, right? <laughs> now, if you're using this to manage a bunch of desktops, like Ubuntu desktops, that's not installed by default, so you're still going to have to install that SSH agent. But if you're installing a, a, a Scent machine or RHEL or something, or Ubuntu server, it's going to be there, right? Uh, designed for, again, he realized that this was, uh, this was remote execution. It was ad hoc. Uh, he also did a lot of config ma management because at that point, uh, you've pretty much got to be do doing that. And it was designed with simplicity in mind. It's a very small program. It doesn't have a whole lot of docs. And, uh, and it's also very easy to get into, just like salt. Now, real quick, I'm going to go through some, uh, some comparisons. Um, first of all, imperative versus declarative. We have uh, the concept of imperative as you know, the script-based approach. We do this, we do this, we do this, do we do this, in that order. Declarative is, I declare that these things need to be done and leave it up to the compiler to do it in whatever order I tell it to do it in. Now, we can add requ requisites, like this requires this, this notifies this and so on, but by default, it just does it in whatever order. Now, on the imperative side, Chef is imperative. We talked about that. Salt is imperative, and Ansible is imperative. However, on the declarative side, Puppet is by default. Uh, it's declarative. Salt is also declarative. Uh, you can just define stuff, and by default, it'll run it in the order that you tell it to do it. But you can also put in those require statements, and it doesn't require that we do everything in order. I can say this thing up here requires this thing down here, so go ahead and do it in those orders, and, uh, and then go back up and, and continue through your, your salt run. Kim? Okay. Uh, DSLs. The problem with DSLs, uh, domain-specific language, is it is specific to a domain, right? Once you've learned the Puppet Manifest, can you use it anywhere else? Are you going to be writing any actual code with it? Is it even Turing complete? No. Uh, and again, with Chef, it is, it's basically Ruby with a lot of extensions, right? But it's specific to, to Chef. Uh, now, again, so DSLs apply to Chef and Puppet. Uh, Salt does have a, a number of DSLs available. In fact, they are all Python. We have straight Python, we have PyDSL, and we have PyObjects that are all available. Uh, my favorite one of those is the, uh, the PyDSL but I'm not going to use it personally unless I absolutely need to. I'll probably fall back to YAML-based configuration, which goes on the no DSL side. And Ansible also uh, uses Ansible. It's not a DSL, it's just, it's just straight YAML. Push versus pull. 
push meaning that uh, on the server we push a command down to the client and then maybe receive, receive some results back and pull means the client requests information from the server. That means the client is either going to be uh, we have to SSH in and kick it off manually or we put it in a cron or the server manages the, uh, the time it connects back to the server. And spool is push based and salt is push based. It makes sense for an SSH one to be push based, right? It's going to be hard to get the client to set up all these you know, reverse tunnels or something like that. Uh, and Puppet and Chef are all uh, uh, pull based, so they all have the client request from the server. And Salt, if you use the Salt call command, it can also request things from the server. And there, there are a few people that still use Salt uh, with the Salt call command running inside a cron job. It's up to you. Uh, I've found that the vast majority of our users, though, prefer the push, push based version. Kick things off from the, the master and, and, uh, and have it do it immediately rather than waiting for, for cron to start something. In fact, we have a number of companies that are using, they've got years and years of formulas in Chef or of uh, Puppet Manifest, and they don't want to throw that away, and who can blame them, right? I'm not going to ask them to throw all that away. That's just, that's not even right. But they'll use salt to kick off their, their puppet jobs or their chef jobs. And so they'll wrap it all together. Uh, config management. Again, Puppet and Chef are designed explicitly for config management. Salt and Ansible do configure ma configuration management as some of the things that they do. Uh, immediate remote execution. Again, config management is a type of remote execution. And Salt and Ansible do it now instead of waiting for the client to, to check in and do things. Okay? Uh, going a little bit more into remote execution, this is something that I personally like about Salt since it is based on a foundation of remote execution. Uh, we have this whole foundation that other things can tie into. We could build monitoring on top of this. We could build our applications to just, just use those uh, communications buses. Um, configure ma management, I already talked about how that's a type of execution, remote execution. SSH is still a type of remote execution, and on its own, it's not automated, right? Um, queuing mechanisms. Anyone here use RabbitMQ? And you guys use it to kick off basically remote execution, right? We just do it with a, a long-term queue. You know, we do this, and then we do this, and we do this as things come along in the queue. Whereas Salt isn't really designed for long-term queues like that. Uh, one could be built in easily enough. It just doesn't have that, that design part in there right now. Okay, let me go through some quick examples. I've got about a minute left here. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the basis of configuration management are three big things, packages, services, and files. You lay down the package, you lay down the files that overwrite the ones that came with the package or augmented, and then you start up a service, right? Now you can go into far, far more detail than this, but uh, this is the baseline I chose for my example. So with Puppet, we're installing Apache, so this is probably a Red Hat type system we're talking about here. Package, ensure installed, that makes sense, right? Uh, service. Again, we're talking about the same service name, HTTPD, ensure that it's running, make sure it's enabled. That means uh, not only is it running now, but when we restart the server, it will still be running, right? Uh, it requires the package to be installed, so we have now made this uh, uh, not quite imperative, but we've put in some requisites there. And it's also going to watch this file down here so that when this file gets changed, it auto automatically just restarts the service, right? And that's kind of the same thing we're going to see in all these examples. Chef, I'm not good at Ruby, guys. But apparently this is correct. We give it a package. We set up a template here, ERB. This is a Ruby-based uh, templating engine, right? And so this is assuming that we've got some templating going on. Puppet was as well. It was also using the ERBs. Uh, so we create a file, and in the service, we have a start and enable. Okay. Uh, salt. We, uh, we set up a state that starts with HTTPD. First, we do a package install, and we do a service running. Uh, we have a file that we've laid down, and again, you see the requires that I've set up here. Sorry, I'm just about done. Yep. Okay, and it's, it's pretty close to the same idea, but you, you see that it's not in a DSL. It's just a list of, uh, of YAML directives, right? And the shortest example I have here is Ansible. There we go. We're back up over here. So hosts all. This is just going to run on everything. And again, very imperative. First, we install Apache. Then we copy down the Apache config. Then we start the service. And really, all the work is being done down here. So name is just giving it a name. And then we have, this is the, the module it's going to use and any arguments that it's going to pass through. Okay. Now, the question is, which one do I use? 
Well, it depends. Okay? And I'm not just going to tell you, start using salt now. Everything else you've done is just throw it away. Okay? I'm not going to tell you that. There's a lot of things to consider. Do you have any legacy CM code, uh, config management code? I don't, when I say legacy, I don't mean all things Puppet, all things Chef, all things Ansible. What I mean is code that we've been using for a couple years. We don't want to just throw it away, right? And if you have a lot of code that you're not willing to throw away, I don't think you should throw it away. I think that salt can help you and can wrap around it and help you do things a little bit better. And when it's time to refactor that code, then it might be time to, to refactor it in salt, or it might be time to just move into a different one and then still use salt to control it or throw salt away immediately. Do you need immediate remote execution or are you willing to wait around for a job to, uh, to kick in whenever it kicks in? That's really important, right? If you're okay with servers just watching themselves and, and getting it a check, then uh, by all means, uh, Chef and, and Papa will be just fine. If you want to do it, things immediately, then you might want to at least think about controlling it with salt. Are you planning on using this layer programmatically, and are you a Ruby shop or a Python shop or some other kind of shop? That's a really important thing to consider. And if you're a Ruby shop, then it could be entirely that Chef is a better tool for you, or that Puppet is a better tool for you. Uh, is it appropriate to use two of these things together or three of these things together? If you have legacy CCM code, there's a good chance that that is appropriate, right? And last but not least, which one feels right? Which one is going to allow me to go home and be nice to people, be nice to my family, and which one is going to <laughs> allow me to go home and, and yell about how rough my day was at work, right? If salt drives you crazy, don't use it. Use something else. If something else drives you crazy, go back to salt. <laughs> okay? But use whichever one feels right. Okay, and guys, spend a lot more time researching these things. Uh, this, this actually came from somebody at Rackspace that asked me, do, I, do you have a really quick way to tell me, um, or for me to tell people what the difference is between the tools? No. You're going to have to look into them, you're going to have to research them, you're going to have to look at some examples, and you're going to have to make your decision based on, based on those informed things. Hopefully I've gotten you guys started in the direction you need to be, need to be in. Um, I'll go ahead and send these slides over to Matt and Matt, and, uh, and they can post them somewhere, I'm sure. Yeah. And, uh, and I guess there'll be videos online. If you guys have any more questions, uh, we're going to have to take off during that first break there. Uh, but we'll be around for the first couple of talks. And uh, you're welcome to email me, josephassaltstack.com. And I'll be happy to, uh, to respond and, and see what we can do. Okay?